ultimately, can anybody be saved? Let's, say, let's answer that question. Ultimately, can anybody be saved? I mean, answer that biblical. Don't, don't think, you know, oh, what is that? Some, is, you know, is he trying to trap us? Is, is that a... Whoever comes to me, I'll let him cast out. So, whoever comes... Let's, let's, think, let's think about this. Where, does, other than Jacqueline, does anybody know where that comes from? John 6, verse 37. Him that comes to me, Christ says he won't cast out. Okay, so I ask this question. Can anybody be saved? Jacqueline answers with, by quoting a verse, basically. But did that answer the question? Jacqueline thought it did. She's training to be a lawyer, so she's probably... She, she's, she's, you know, she knows about court cases now. She, she worked as an intern all summer. So she knows basically how to make a case. But what do you guys think? Did she answer the question? I would say this. I don't know what she meant her answer to be by, by quoting that. I'm, I'm suspecting that I think I know how she meant to answer. But I would say this. Based on that text, can anyone be saved? Hi, guys. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. I would say no. Not anybody can be saved. Only who can be saved? Those who come to Christ. It's kind of like John 3.16. Come on, somebody quote that. Again, let's take that text. Can anyone be saved? And the, the question is, well, not anybody can be saved. He that believes can be saved. In fact, he that believes will be saved. Him that comes to Christ will be saved, and Christ won't cast them out. But look, you go to Christ when you believe in Christ. You go to Christ because you believe Christ can forgive your sins. You go to Christ because you believe He's got something to offer you you can't find anywhere else. You need Him. You, look, you see in Christ, He is my only hope. But I would say, okay, the, both those verses say, no, not everybody can be saved. Those, those who come, those who believe can be saved. But even though those seem to be limited, they don't specifically say that there's anybody who can't be saved. Is there somebody in the world who can't be saved? I mean, I, and I'm not giving you trick questions. I'm really wanting your minds to, to go through the Word of God and to think, is there anybody that can't be saved? Where the sacrifices for sinners and all sinners? Not those who blaspheme against the Holy There's one. Bla if somebody blasphemes the Holy Spirit, can they be saved? Jesus seems to indicate not that there's a sin you can commit that will not be forgiven either in this age or in the one to come, right? You guys have read that. So, are there some people who can't be saved? I would say, yeah. How, how about, think with me more. Is there anybody else in the Scriptures that can't be saved? seems to indicate that there are people that if they are subjected to certain amounts of light and operations of the Spirit of God cannot be renewed to repentance, right? Again, that may be along the lines of, of an unpardonable sin. It may be receiving so much light and going over this. There does seem to be a point of no return in this life. Would, you guys would agree, right? I mean, there are plenty of verses that seem to indicate that. Are there other people who can't be saved? What does that say? Well, 
But how, how would that indicate that there's somebody that can't be saved? They don't accept them. They don't what? They don't believe. They don't believe, but what if they do believe? Then they can be saved. If you persist in unbelief. Well, let's talk about that. What if somebody persists in unbelief, obviously to the point of death? There are all sorts of people who have died who can't be saved. There are people who come, come to a place in this life where they cross a line, but we don't know when that is. We know the line of death. That's done. You're over. You die in unbelief. Basically, all unbelievers, you die that way, you're in outer darkness, folks. There's, there's no second chance. This, this Catholic teaching that, that there is basically um, a way to pay for sin after you die and that there is a purgatory or any kind of second chance, uh, folks, that's, that's a product of the imagination of, of that Catholic system. The Bible doesn't speak anything about it. We have death, and then following that, the judgment. There is no second chance in the Scriptures. I mean, basically, if death takes us, we are, we are sealed in that doom if we die without Christ. Can somebody prove that? Can somebody prove that from the Scriptures? Um, Lazarus and the rich man, that, that definitely, you die in your sin, you go to a place where you are separated from God's people. Definitely. Um, we could prove that some other ways. But I come back to the living. Let's say we have some living people who have not committed the unpardonable sin. Can anybody in that camp be saved? John, John 10, 26, no, 26. Well, you do not believe because you are not according to God. Ooh, you do not believe because you're... Say, can, can you quote that text? <clears throat> it says, but well, you do not believe because you are not a part of my God. Ooh, yikes. What does that say? If you're not part of the flock, you don't believe. You can't believe. Are there some people that the Bible says can't believe? There's another place where Jesus addressing those, those same Pharisees. He th says things like, how can you believe? Anybody think of where it says that? John 8. Let me ask you this. In light of what we're getting to, let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe that the Bible teaches that there are elect? That word's found in the Scriptures. You guys believe that God predestinates? The, Bible's, the Bible clearly talks about about the fact that there are vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. The Bible clearly says in Romans 9 that God has compassion upon whom He will have compassion and He hardens whom He will. The Bible says He hardened Pharaoh. The Bible says that He raised up Pharaoh to get glory with Him. A vessel of wrath prepared, fitted for destruction. Let me ask you this question. Does God know before the foundation of the earth those He chose? Anybody know where the Bible says that? Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. God chose a people before the foundation of the world. Anybody have an idea where it says that God predestinated to conform a certain people that He foreknew to the image of Christ? Romans 8, about 
verse 29. Let me ask you this. Is it possible to be saved if you're elect? Or if you're, pardon me, is it possible to be saved if you're not elect? Is it possible to be saved if you weren't chosen before the foundation of the world? Let me ask you this. Is it possible to be saved if you are not regenerated? If you are not born again, can you enter the kingdom of God? Doesn't the Scripture say you must be born again? So, how is a man born again? How is he born again? By what? By the will of God. Anybody know where the Scripture says that? We're born not of the will of man, not of the will of the flesh, not, not of bloodlines. We're not... John 1.13. If we're not born again, we can't receive, we can't inherit the kingdom of God. We're born of the Spirit. The Spirit is like the wind that blows in the trees. Can men caught... Can man cause himself to be born again? Salvation is of the Lord. Let me ask you this. If God doesn't save us, can you be saved? If God doesn't regenerate us, can you be saved? If God didn't choose you before the foundation of the world, can you be saved? If God doesn't choose to have compassion upon you, can you be saved? Now, brethren... If, if in light of all that, you now take a trip down to the Alamo to speak truth to people on the streets, or you go to college campus, or as we're going to endeavor in a, in a, hopefully in just a week or two to in, start this major campaign of reaching this east side with the gospel, and you have somebody that's standing before you and they say, what must I do to be saved? Three years ago, I got to the place where I said some of the same things that I'm saying right now, and I said, folks, you believe these things. You believe in election. You believe in predestination. You believe except God chooses you, you can't be saved. You believe that if you're not elect, you can't be saved. You believe that if God doesn't have compassion upon you, you can't be saved. You believe that if you're a vessel of wrath, you can't be saved. You believe all these things, right? Yes. Okay, what's your gospel? And there was an eerie silence in that room. And, and if I remember, it was Jonathan Payne who said, yeah, when we were Arminians, we knew what to tell people, but we don't know what to tell people anymore. <laughs> Brethren, let me tell you this. All that I said is true, but you know the Bible does not. It tells us that there is an elect people and that God chose. Brethren, so that we can glory in the God who is sovereign and saves. But all the more so that we can send people to Him and trust Him and look to Him. That salvation is not of man, it's of the Lord. So if you need to be saved, go to the Lord. He is sovereign to save. He is powerful to save. He is almighty to save. And what our sister Jacqueline said is absolutely true. You know what happens to people? They become seized up and paralyzed. That, oh no, there's an elect. What does that have to do? What does that have to do with the situation? If Look, if Jesus comes to you and says, if you'll come to me, I will not cast you out. In other words, if you come to me, it's, it's in the negative. I will not cast you out. But let's, let's change it rather than a positive and a negative, if you come to me, that's the positive, I will not, that's the negative, let's change it to two positives. If you come to me, I will keep you. 
I will put my arms around you. I will pull you in. I will make you mine. If he comes to you and says that, then what does it have to do with you whether you're reprobate? What does it have to do with you whether you've committed the unpardonable sin? What does it have to do with you as to whether God has chosen you, or foreknown you, predestinated? What does it have to do with you whether God has decided to show compassion on you? What does it have to do with you whether you're a vessel of mercy or vessel of wrath? If He comes to you and He says, come to me, be done with all that. You say, what if I've committed the unpardonable sin? So what? Go to Him. So what if you've committed it? If you go to Him, He says He won't cast you out. So be done with whether you've committed the unpardonable sin. Be done with whether you're, you're reprobate or not. Be done with whether you're elect or foreordained, predestinated, or any of that stuff. Be done with it. Do you have a desire to go to Christ? You know why they wouldn't go to Him? Because they wouldn't believe in Him. That was bottom line. Look, the, the issue is this. If you won't go to Him, you will die in your sin. If you don't believe on Him with a faith that takes you to Him, you will die in your sin. But here's the thing, our gospel is not sit still and wait for God to regenerate you. That is not our gospel. You know what our gospel is? Go to Christ. Our gospel is, well that's what I want to talk about. What is our gospel? We're, if we're going to be an evangelistic church, we better have a gospel. You know what? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But that doesn't mean every single thing you say is the power of God unto salvation. You see what I'm saying? Just because you're even a Christian, if you go out into this world and you just say all manner of things, look, if you go out into this world as a Christian who has been fallen into this distorted hyper-Calvinism and you go tell people you need to be born again and they say, how do I do that? Well, that's a good question. Only God can do that. You better, you better sit there and wait until He does that. That is not the gospel. That is not the power of God unto salvation. We can tell people all manner of different things. You can, you can go and you can tell people, I, I'll tell you this, you as a Christian can invite people to church. That's not a bad thing. You can tell people, you can tell people different things and even biblical truth, but it not necessarily be the gospel. Remember what, what the term gospel is. What is it? Good it's good news. Brethren, there is a message that is good news. How did I even get there? I, I got... Did you guys hear about these Christians that go to soldiers' funerals and hold up signs blessing God for dead soldiers? Blessing God for 9-11? You guys heard any of that? I, I really had not been exposed to that until um, I was... Sam Patron sent me a link and I was trying to watch something, and you know how it is, you always get those thumbnails on the side. And I just saw one that, I thought, what in the world is that? Brethren, for people to run around and basically say that they're blessing God for God's demonstrations of wrath on this country, that's not good news. Just a message of wrath is not good news. Folks, that's the bad news. Now that's the bad news sometimes we've got to give people so that they come to realize how good the good news is. You know, if people basically walk around thinking I'm a pretty good person and God thinks I'm a pretty good person and of course I'm going to heaven and of course God loves me and of course He has a wonderful plan for my life. You know, people that are just as lost as anything that walk around thinking that, yeah, they probably needed a dose of bad news. But folks, the bad news by itself is not good news. You, you can throw some law out there, you can throw some bad news, you can throw some wrath of God out there when it seems that you've got some people that are just pr frankly walking around pretty lackadaisical about the whole thing and not really coming to grips with the fact of how serious trouble they're in. You may need to take people. After all, you remember Paul talks about the power of God in this gospel gospel being the power of God unto salvation. You, you know what he does, right? I mean, he's doing this in verse 16 of Romans chapter 1. What's he doing in verse 18? 
He's talking about the wrath of God revealed against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men. There is a place for that. There's a place to go there to really cement the fact that, folks, you are not good. You are not, as, you are not good like you think you are. You are not on your, to, your way to heaven like you think you are. God is not pleased with you like you think He is. <coughs> Brethren, there may be a place for that. But that in itself is not the good news. That may be a setup for it. So what I'm asking tonight, what is the good news? Look, if we want to see people saved, then we want to be giving a message that is indeed the power of God unto salvation. We don't want to give people a message that God's not going to use to save them. We want to be faithful to people's souls. We want to give them the truth. We want to give them a solid gospel. If we're going to talk to people, hey, I know it's true, you can't tell people everything every time you talk to somebody. I, I mean, you just, you, you simply can't go through every truth that possibly could be told. But what are some basic essentials to our gospel message? Let me ask this first. What are things we don't, what are, what are, what are elements of what is called the gospel today that we really can't find in the Bible? What are elements that in many circles is claimed to, purported to be the gospel but you can't find it in the Word of God. Prosperity. I'll tell you this, this is not good news. They're the best news is in the Gospel. To worldly people, good news is that God's going to make me rich. He's going to make me healthy and wealthy. The prosperity gospel is a false gospel. I will tell you this, through much tribulation we what? What is it? We shall enter the kingdom of God through much tribulation. Brethren, in many ways, when we come to Christ, there, there are many ways in this life that things get better, undeniably. But in many ways, life now, here and now, gets worse. What are the ways that Christ promises us life will be worse now if we come to Him? Well, let me just give you an idea. In Luke 14, he says, count the cost. Why would he say that? Because there is a cost. And because coming to Christ is going to cost you something. The health, wealth, prosperity people are not telling people the truth. The truth is not what they're saying. What is the truth? What does Christ guarantee you if you come to Him? Division in the family. He even says some of your own family members are going to put you to death. He does not come to bring peace in the family. He comes to bring a sword. You're going to find members of your household, your own enemies. You're going to find that they're against you. You're going to find that basically following Christ, all of a sudden, it was amazing to me. When I first came to the Lord, I, I got, you know what, I was a black sheep in the family. I mean, I was the one that other people could measure themselves by and feel pretty good about themselves. When I came to the Lord, I suddenly realized they liked me better that way than this way. See, I made them feel good that way. Now my life was a rebuke to them. Conflict in the family. What's something else Christ guarantees us? Lose your life. Brethren, we may lose... A, for one thing, he says we need to hate our life. He does use that terminology. He says it may cost us our life. He says that we will find ourselves as sheep in the midst of wolves. 
If you guys have never watched a National Geographic on wolves, I, I, I commend that to you. Take any kind of animal, like, like a, a rabbit, or, you know, so even bigger things, but you throw them out in a pack of wolves, especially when they're real hungry. It's been a hard winter. You watch what they do to it. Brethren, when Jesus used terminology in the Bible, it, he was not in the habit of being sarcastic and basically creating a false picture. Brethren, it has been said Christianity in the United States of America right now is a Disneyland. And I'll tell you this, compared to what most Christians have had to endure in most times, we've got it easy. This is not the norm. But I can tell you this, if you will live for Christ, you will find persecution in this country. You will find that, that they will despise you, that they won't eat with you for the sake of Christ. You identify with Christ, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to lose friends. You're going to find that people will not want to continue the same kind of relationship and friendships that they had with you before. If you're determined to live for Christ, I'll tell you, where did the most vehement and violent persecution come in Jesus' day and in Paul's day? Where did it come? Came, yeah, and what was in Jerusalem? The temple. It was the religious capital. You know where the strongest persecution came in Jesus' day? Who did they bring Him before? They, bring, they brought Him before... They brought Him before the high priest. The high priest and his men were the ones striking Him. You remember who it was that was calling for his blood. It was not Pilate. It was the Jews. It was the religious leaders. You live righteously, you will find religious leaders hate you. You will find that many in the church are the ones that are your most bitterest enemies. What else does Jesus promise us if we follow him that isn't real delightful in this world? What's that? Definitely hate. The world will hate you. He said, if it hated me, it will hate you. If you live like he lived, don't think that you're going to be treated any better than your master. If they treated him that way, how should you expect to be treated? Brethren, that's just a reality. And we go around teaching people that it's other than that. We go around, if, you, if we basically go around imitating this, this Joel Osteen or, or this Benny Hinn message or these, the, you know, the, the Kenneth Copeland message. Brethren, it is a false gospel. It is a false gospel. And I'll tell you what, they are eating it up in third world countries. These, these hopes of healing, these hopes of prosperity. Brethren, I'll tell you what, God has given us prosperity in this country, but He doesn't guarantee that. And in fact, if we have that prosperity, we have a high accountability and we better be using it. He didn't give it to us for us to indulge ourselves with. He gave it to us to be, support the gospel. He's going to hold us accountable. You, you think about those parables where those, those servants are brought forth before the Lord. You better believe it. Everyone in this room, you may say, I'm poor, I'm poor. You could, by comparative standards to the rest of the world, you are not poor. And you will be held accountable. Brethren, that doesn't make us guilty, but it makes us accountable. And we need to be faithful stewards with what God has given us. If God gave us riches, He did not give them to us to consume upon ourselves. He gave them to us to invite the poor, the lame, the halt, the blind to our houses and feed them. He gave us riches so that we could be generous and full of good works and giving. I know there's a, um, there's a scripture that says the Sodom of Gomorrah was destroyed because they had an abundance of bread. They, did not, um, they didn't share it. Yeah, I'll tell you this. You want to you find what God's wrath pours out towards? 
you don't take care of the widow and the orphan. The fast God desires, you take the stranger in. You basically, you pour yourself out to feed the hungry. You find that in the Scriptures. Brethren, true and undefiled religion before the Lord is to visit the widow and the orphan in their affliction. You find out on Judgment Day when He comes, He takes particular interest. Did you visit those in prison, those in the hospital? Brethren, you young people, look, He saved you to live your life the way He lived. He went about doing good. Not just to come to a Bible study and, and to soak up truth. He saved you to be rich in good works, to be zealous of good works, to be fruitful. He told His disciples that, that much, they're going to glorify, they're, you're going to glorify your Father in heaven through much fruit. Not just a little, much. He redeemed us for that purpose. But back to the Gospel. What's some other things we can tell people that is just not true that we hear a lot in the Gospel. Sinner's prayer. You say this prayer and you'll be saved. Brethren, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say there's any kind of formula in saying a prayer that will lead to your salvation. Now look, everyone who's been saved has called upon the Lord. So that's not to say that there isn't a sinner's prayer. There is. Anybody remember a sinner's prayer in the Scriptures? Oh, God be merciful to me, a sinner. You guys ever read about that? This tax collector, Pharisee, both of them are praying. Yes, there is a way to pray. But there's no guarantee that if you just say a prayer, or you walk an aisle, or you raise a hand, you basically walk down to this some altar and say a prayer that you're going to you're going to be saved. There is no guarantee. Now look, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and your call upon the Lord is sincere, you will be saved, undoubtedly. But so yeah, we, it, this isn't just a prayer. This isn't a health, wealth, prosperity thing. Is there anything else in the Gospel that that definitely is erroneous. There's there's one right there. God loves you. How many? Uh, th that's. I don't know how much this is still prevalent, but God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, brethren. Can I tell you when Jesus said, "Few there be that find it," God's plan for most people is utterly wretched. God's plan for anybody who continues to reject the Gospel and reject the Christ of the Gospel, the plan God has for them is not a good one. It is a wretched one. We, look, we are in no place to tell anybody God has a wonderful plan for your life. We are in no place to tell people anything other than if you reject Christ, there will be hell to pay. And it will be miserable all the more because you as a sinner rejected a Savior that was offered to you. He came to seek and save sinners. And if you will reject Him, it will be utterly wretched. Brethren, we have no promise for people other than that if they reject this Gospel. How about any something else? What about the two extremes of uh, easy believism and works-based salvation? Easy believism? How do we stay away from that? How do we stay away from these two extremes? Well, one, one thing, let's just run to the other extreme. Brethren, a false gospel is any gospel that says that somebody's got to accomplish some works to be saved. Now, the thing about repentance, the thing about faith, is that yes, they must repent and they must believe, but we need to understand, repentance is not penance. It isn't cleaning your life. It isn't walking on your knees till they bleed to get right with God. Now, even though you might say, well, we wouldn't think of doing that. People have a clean-up scheme all the time when they hear repentance. Listen, 
Re true repentance is turning away from every work, away from every self-effort. That's what that is. Faith in Christ is looking outside myself and trusting Christ. It is a total abandonment of works. And if anything, if we are preaching a gospel that makes repentance into a work, it is a false gospel. Yes, they must repent. Yes, they must. But brethren, repentance is where I just fall into the arms of Christ and forsake my own efforts and my own works. On the other extreme, easy believism is basically this, that we don't want to preach a gospel that leaves men the same. It's basically this, Jesus Christ promises to save you from your sins if you go to Him. In other words, if you go to Him, He is going to, He promises in the New Covenant, He will cleanse you of your idols. You know what that means? Every true Christian in this room has some idea. Christ comes and says, I lay claim to your life and I see you have something in your life you're a little bit too fond of. I want you to give it up. Brethren, we preach a gospel that changes men. We preach a gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And He promises that we will be conformed to the image of Christ. He promises that we will be delivered from the dominion of sin. He promises that He is going to eradicate idols from our life. He promises that He is going to work righteousness and true holiness. Brethren, the reason He can say that without holiness no man will see the Lord, the reason He can say it's not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, who will inherit the kingdom of heaven, rather those who do the will of my Father in heaven, the reason He can say those is because He has determined when He saves somebody to come in and cause them to do the will of the Father. He's going to write His law on their heart. That means they're going to do it. They're going to keep His statutes. Perfect? No. But as a rule, yes. He's going to work righteousness into the life of these people. He is going to produce good works in their life. People love to quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2.10 says we are His workmanship created. We are actually created in Christ Jesus for good works, unto good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He prepared them. Brethren, I'll tell you this. You come to Christ and all of a sudden good works are not a product of your life. It's evidence that you have not truly been saved. James says that faith that is not accompanied by works, it's dead. So these are the two extremes. You don't tell anybody that there's any work you have to do to be saved. But if you go to Christ to be saved, Christ is going to set Himself to eradicate your life of every sin in this life in a tremendous way through sanctification, conforming you to the image of that Christ whom you're beholding, and degree by degree He's transforming you into that same image. And then upon the end of this life, we will see Him and we will become as He is. And there will be a fullness of that worked out. But brethren, these are things not. But let's go through it real quick. What are aspects of the gospel that we better include? So righteousness, I mean, in what sense? Ooh, right there. God's righteousness. How about this? In Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, you have that reality that the gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes. And then you got the Jew first and the, also the Greek or the Gentile there. But here's the thing. For in it, what is revealed? 
the righteousness of God. Now you go over to Romans chapter 3, you find that the righteousness of God is not speaking about the righteousness that God has. Well, this is not talking about an attribute of God. This is talking about the righteousness of God. In other words, the righteousness that He requires that you have, that comes from Him. It's of Him in that He provides it. We have not been able. It's the standard He sets for any man to be received in glory. And we find over there in Romans chapter 3, what is it, about verse uh, 22 maybe? It's a righteousness of God that is for everyone who believes in Christ. Here's the thing, if you're going to tell men about the gospel in the scriptures, you better tell them about a righteousness they don't have that God provides for all who come to Christ in faith. Brethren, this is key. When Jesus was leaving the world, He said to His disciples, I'm going to send a Comforter. I'm going to send the Spirit. He said He's going to convict of righteousness. Brethren, when you preach that Gospel, work with the Spirit. The Spirit came to convince men of righteousness. When you talk to people, you emphasize God demands a righteousness. God demands this righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, He who knew no sin became sin that what? We might become the righteousness of God in Him. You see, He became sin. He worked out a righteousness. He worked it out. He came and fulfilled perfect righteousness. He earned a righteousness for us that God would... What's the word? How does His righteousness become ours? What's that word? Impute. If you don't know that word, that's okay. But you need to know you need to know what God has done for the sinner even if you don't use the word imputation in your evangelism. But you need to tell people that God... That, brethren, we've got to take people here. God demands righteousness. The wage of sin is death. Look, people have got this idea... You ever, t you ever lied? Well, yeah, I've, t I've lied, but I'm not that bad. You ever heard somebody say that? I'm not that bad. What do you mean that bad? What, what are you saying? You're not how bad? Well, yeah, I've sinned, but I'm not so bad that, I'm, that God would throw me into hell. Well, really? Where'd you get that from? They got it in their own mind. Brethren, when we were lost, we thought the same way. We thought, oh, we're lost, but we realized we had sin. We're all sinners. But I'm not that bad. Well, that bad for what? That bad for God to throw you into hell forever and forever and forever and the smoke of your torment go up forever and forever and forever and the fury of, of God, the Almighty, bearing down on you forever and forever and forever and you having to endure a fiery furnace and your torment and basically an outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, yeah, I've told lies, but I'm not, I'm not that bad. You're not. Every sin has a wage of death, eternal death, and it is a falling short of the glory of God. Do you not realize that you have despised the glory of an infinite holy God? Men don't have any idea how wicked their sin is. Brethren, I'll tell you what, nobody appreciates a righteousness of God provided for them through Christ until they come to realize they don't have a righteousness. When they come to realize that they are dressed in rags when it comes to standing before God, oh brethren, finding out there is a righteousness, a righteousness not my own that I can be robed with and stand before God in full, pristine perfection. After all the sin that I have committed, God justifies the ungodly. That means He declares righteous, wicked men. Brethren, that is the heart of the Gospel. 
if you're going to be out there on the streets, you're going to be going door to door. You don't. Our gospel message isn't, well, unless you're born again. Yes, you can tell them that, unless you're born again. But brethren, bottom line, our message to people isn't, well, that's a work of God, and unless He does it, there's nothing you can do, so you just basically need to sit over there. Brethren, that isn't it. Our gospel is a message of righteousness that has been earned and worked out. Christ sweat it out. Christ, perfection. Every point He learned obedience, but it was an obedience that was growing and becoming fuller and deeper and richer, never mixed with a hint of sin at any point. And He earned it so that it might be imputed to my account. Brethren, you find that truth in Romans chapter 5. He, he has earned this thing and listen to how it says it there. In Romans 5 and about verse 19, you have this reality. Listen to this. As by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Jesus Christ, by His obedience, makes by the obedience of one man, many are made righteous. Brethren, we'll talk more about this next week. There's other aspects that I want to hit on. But brethren, as Paul is putting together this monstrous letter of Romans concerning the Gospel, that's, that's what he's writing about, to give us one of the most extensive apostolic treatments of the gospel in the Word of God. And he says this, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. This obedience of Christ is revealed. Brethren, if you're going to preach the gospel and your gospel cannot lack this, lack many things, but it cannot lack this, that Jesus Christ earned a righteousness that can be had by the most ungodly sinner by faith. Brethren, that is the glory of the gospel. That is the heart. That is the soul. Brethren, you do not want to tell people there's nothing they can do. You want to tell people this message and you want to tell them believe on it. And in believing it, you will be justified. And explain to them, justified means it's a legal term that God will count you as perfect as Christ is. Not that you will actually be righteous like He is, but God in His courtroom will legally declare it to be so. And so even though you still have sin to wrestle with, and even though there are many imperfections He needs to work out of you, and idols that He will cleanse you from, and even though you will not reach absolute perfect standing in a in a practical manner until you come to see Christ face to face and to be with Him in glory. From that moment you believe, God will hold no sin against you. He will count you perfect. And He will robe you with such a righteousness. Listen, this is why as Paul is developing all of this gospel in Romans, that he says things like this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you catch that? Who are in Christ Jesus. They're covered by Him. They're in Him. There's no condemnation. You see, there can't be any condemnation if God doesn't hold any sin against you. you. You read along further there in Romans 8, and that same truth comes at us. It says, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not 
Also with Him graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is in His seating for us. You see that? Who is to condemn? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Listen, if you go to Jesus Christ in faith, God will justify you and declare you righteous. Who can condemn? Even if you, like a Christian, fall into the same kind of sin that David fell into, and you fell flat on your face in some sexual immorality, who's going to condemn you? Oh, Satan may bring accusation, but it, it can't stick. It's not that nobody does bring charges against us. When it says who can bring a charge against us, God's elect. Who is there to do that? It doesn't mean that there aren't people who don't do it. People do it and the devil does it. What it means is it won't stick. In God's courtroom, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall away. Why? Because you stand there with a perfect standing. Jesus Christ has paid it all. Not only has He paid your sin debt, He's earned a perfect Life. You see, when a person is saved, that word imputation, our sin is imputed to him. He who knew no sin becomes sin. And his righteousness is imputed to us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our sin goes to him, his righteousness comes to us. Ladies and gentlemen, when you proclaim the gospel to people, this needs to be the heart and soul of your message. If you leave this out, you've left, you've left the good news out. This is the good news. The good news is when some poor wretch comes with a load of sin and such wickedness in their life, brethren, basically in circles where their gospel is nothing more than morality, and it's no gospel at all. When some poor, pathetic wretch of a sinner comes, and basically you've got a bunch of Pharisees, there's no good news in all that. But when somebody comes and you can say, you know what, God saves the chief of sinners, no matter what wickedness you've got in your life, if you will go to Christ, even if you've committed the unpardonable sin ten times over, you guys obviously recognize if somebody actually commits it, but the thing is, nobody knows. And the people that did commit it didn't care. People that did commit it are so callous, they don't care. If somebody comes along and they cares, who cares if you've committed it as long as you'll go to Christ. If you see in Christ a righteousness to be robed with and you say, you know what, that just fits such a sinner as me. A Savior who earned a righteousness for a wretch like me. That's what I need. He won't cast you out. The righteous shall live by faith. That's right. The righteous shall live by faith. How are they righteous? They are righteous by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. That doesn't mean those who are perfect in this life, the way they live day by day, hour by hour, that they never sin. That means those who are righteous in the courtroom of heaven, those who God counts righteous, they live by faith. Abraham believed God and what? It was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham did not live a perfect life, but he was counted righteous. You know what? 
there was a there was a young lady at SAC today and I went over to her and I basically explained this to her and I said have you ever heard that before she shook her head brethren we are not in a Christian nation we are in a nation where people do not know the gospel this this city of ours this camp, these campuses we go out to, this east side, brethren, they, they don't know the gospel. So be clear. Well, next week we'll dive into other things that are critical to our gospel message. But brethren, this, this is the heart and soul. Any last comment? Alrighty, brethren. Yeah, I don't think we're going to do away with our Bible study. But I, think, I, th I, think, I think we'll just have to... I want to I cement this gospel so that we can preach it. But brethren, this means we have to go out too. We just can't come in and learn it. We have to go out and preach it. And like I said today, um, I was telling you know some folks that Look, not everybody has the same gifts. If, if you can put a track in somebody's hand, but you don't have any words to say after that, then God help you to do it. If you can stand off at a distance and, and walk with the people and talk, basically, you know, pray for those who are doing it, then do that. We need people that pray. We need people that pass out tracks. We need people that can speak the word. Not everybody can do the same thing. Not everybody's gifted to do the same thing. But brethren, I just ask you, please do your part. Not all will pray just on the same street or on the same campus, but it, they may pray at home. The body is different. The body is unique. Our gifts are different. Our gifts are unique. But play the part you can. Let's glorify the... We have a... Trem brethren, this, this news is good. I mean, this, this is fantastic news. And what I'm finding is the vast bulk of the city in which we live, they don't know it. Amen. We do. And we're the witnesses to take it out. We are the ones that Christ has given this generation to. This is our generation, beloved. Let's be faithful. If they're going to go to hell like Spurgeon said long ago, brethren, yeah, may it be with our arms wrapped around their ankles. May it be us holding them back. If they're going to go to hell, let's let it be them jumping over all of our gospel appeals and all of our loving endeavors and all of our efforts. If they'll go and they're determined to go, may it not be through our inactivity and silent lips and lack of prayer. God help us. Alrighty. We're done.